uh, answer questions in the end. Um, and I think the recording has started. Yes, the recording has started. So Kelly, does it look like we have anyone else coming or the lobby's cleared? The lobby's clear. Mm. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get this started. Uh, my name again, Maria Urshad. I'm with the Park Houston Division. We've been talking and meeting with you all for some time now about uh, challenges in the Almeda Corridor. Um, on the call today, I have some Park Houston colleagues. I have Melanie Curry. I have Norman Holt, who is our division manager for uh, meter operations. We have Kelly Frazier, um, Stephen Ivory, and did I miss anyone? I can't see all the cameras, so I think I got everyone. Um, but uh, thank you all. I'm on. Rami's on the other Rami, Rami Arafat, our division manager over customer service. So um, I am going to go right. ahead and get started today. A reminder again to please keep your devices on mute. And also, in case you just joined, this a presentation is being recorded and we will post the link online um, after this meeting. So if you want to go back and take a look at it, you are more than welcome to. So let's go ahead and get started. Almeda Corridor, I think we all pretty much know the challenges in the area. It is very much a mixed use area. There's a lot of, there's some change going on. Um, we do have residential that is abutting right next to commercial. Um, there is a need to manage the on-street uh, parking availability and that curb space um, that is in such high demand in the area. So in the past, we have talked to y'all about the community parking program. We've already implemented this in Museum Park, and this is something that we think will make a difference to the curb usage in the Almeda Corridor. Um, and part of that was asking for feedback um, from the stakeholders in the area. So we put out an uh, online form and we um, asked for public feedback from Almeda stakeholders. I wanna share some of that feedback with you. So we had about 29 responses, well, exactly 29 responses um, in that time period. We opened up the, um, the feedback uh, from May 1st until May 28th, so it was almost a full month. And just based on asking, you know, do you support it, yes or no, 41% of those 29 responses were not in, in with support, whereas 59% were in opposition. Now the 59, if you dug into the comments, we got a lot of customer feedback from what the customers were saying, um, a lot of challenges um, that they were, um, and it wasn't so much that they were against the, the time limits, but it was, let's do something a little different. So we've, we've looked at those comments. We did get requests for meters. Um, we did see, uh, you know, a parking benefit district is an option with meters and what a parking benefit district does is it returns a net portion of the, uh, returns a portion of the net meter revenues back to the district for public improvement projects. This is lighting, landscaping, um, additional parking, uh, pedestrian walkways, anything that's in the pu public realm can be um, funded using these net meter revenues. <clears throat> With meters, you know, visitors and patrons then make the choice to pay for the parking. Um, and it also, uh, helps move people into parking lots and promotes like a park once kind of philosophy on that. So based on the feedback that we received, we uh, one of the big things that we did hear back from was the residential permit parking that's already in place in the areas. So we we are saying that moving forward with community parking, if RPP is already on the street, there would be no change to those regulations. So in order for the that street, for example, Rosedale, which has RPP after 5 p.m., they would need to opt into community parking programs. So that would be the same process. You take a petition, talk, talk amongst your neighbors, and then we can look at that and then opt into community parking. If it's currently RPP, we will leave it as RPP. We won't make any changes um, to that street. We also looked at the residential parking only. So our re original recommendation was two hours time limits until 10 p.m. Uh, a lot of feedback was that, you know, no parking is fine, but push it up earlier. So we're recommending that no parking begin at 8 p.m. Monday through Sunday. Another comment that came in our last meeting was that trash is not being picked up uh, on Tuesdays 
because of the parking challenges, trash cans being moved and whatnot. So the first time we, we heard this issue, we talked to solid waste management and at the time, they did not seem to see an issue. They said they could work around it. But this time when we went back to them after our last meeting, they did agree and they did see that there was challenges collecting trash in the area. So we've worked with the traffic engineer to develop signage, which is something that we don't do in Houston. We haven't, this would be the first area that we'd have uh, signage to reflect no parking on Tuesday mornings from 7 a.m. to noon. And that would be for trash pickup. And that would mean nobody could park at that time. Only the garbage cans could be on the street. Um, solid waste management did, did commit to having the trash picked up by noon. They said that time frame from 7 a.m. to noon would be sufficient. Um, and, the, and so that the trash could be picked up. So that was another uh, change that we looked at making based on the feedback that was provided to us at the last meeting. So I wanted to show you guys what the signage will look like, because we're talking about a lot of different restrictions. Um, you're getting into, you know, downtown level signage now. Downtown, we have, you know, so the two or three signs per pole so that we can have flexible use of that curb space. And in order to have the same, we'd have, uh, you know, a couple of signs per sign pole. So I wanted you guys to see that uh, before we order these and, and talk about deploying them. So this is how the signage would look. Um, we'd have a two hour parking for um, uh, from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. That'd be the two hour time limits. And then Tuesdays would be garbage pickup. And of course, this my sign here is not as um, neat as the one that the Public Works Department would make for us. So please forgive my a little messiness on it. But it would be 7 a.m. to noon or 12 p.m. on Tuesdays for trash pickup. And then it would be permit parking only from 8 p.m. to 9 a.m. And then you kind of go back to the two hour time limits at 9 a.m. We also added a tow away zone sign so that vehicles that are parked in violation of those no parking signs could be towed um, should the need arise. Another thing that we've been discussing with um, the Greater Southeast Management District is, you know, we do have a nighttime parking challenge and with all the parking being removed, uh, we wanted to try and kind of curb the cruising that's going to start happening on Almeda. So we're looking at piloting a, a unified valet zone. So what a unified valet zone would do is the city would work with the Greater, Greater Southeast Management District to identify specific locations on Almeda, not on the residential streets, um, and issue an RFP to look for a valet operator who would set up, you know, operations in those in those locations. And then the Greater Southeast Management District has the lots that are not so desirable for walking purposes, but for valet purposes, those lots uh, could be very useful and the cars could be stored in those lots. Um, and what a unified valet zone does is you set up multiple zones like within that, that block. So if someone wants to go to the nighttime economy where the clubs are, they can drop their car off over there. Um, and maybe they, or let, let me turn that around. Let's say they, they have dinner at a restaurant and they drop their car off a little further down, closer to Rosedale and Almeda. We set a zone there. And then afterwards they decide they wanna walk down a couple of blocks and have a drink at one of the bars. They can pick up their car uh, from the valet zone that would be closer to the bar. So you'd have two or three zones. We'd have to work with a traffic engineer to identify those locations. But basically you drop off your car at one place and you could pick it up at one, either one of the other zones that are available that are closest to you. Um, and then if we could make use of those satellite lots that um, are currently underused because people want to park closer, then we could probably you know, increase the foot traffic and reduce the uh, vehicles circling around. Um, another thing that we've talked to the Greater Southeast Management District is about those lots and having them available for employees for daytime use. So again, uh, the, the employees that work in the area may be parking on the street. Almeda itself, the actual street Almeda will not have any time limits. It will remain as is with the two hour mobility restrictions from four to 6 p.m. But the lots are available and the Greater Southeast Management District is looking at enhanced security and um, lighting and signage in those lots so that people will feel comfortable uh, leaving their cars in those locations. 
So just to talk a little bit about the uh, community parking program ordinance and permits. Uh, permits are for single family homes and they cost $28.90 per year. Um, the price of the permits is linked to the CPI. So they do have incremental increases every year, which is why it's such an odd number of 28.90. Um, it goes up a few uh, quor quarters um, every year annually. The limit for a single family home for the number of permits is three. So you can buy three permits. And what these permits will do is, res is will exempt the car that is displaying that permit from the on-street restrictions. So whether it's time limits or whether it's uh, resident parking only after 8 p.m., any vehicle displaying one of these CPP permits will be exempt from those from those on street restrictions so they can park all day without uh, being cited and they could stay there at night without being cited. So with multifamily properties, so the, the way the CPP ordinance is written, when a multifamily uh, facility has between nine and 125 units, uh, they are limited to one permit per household at a 0.5 ratio. So let's take, for example, I'm just going to make this up. If there's a multifamily facility that has 50 units, that whole building is eligible for 25 units, uh, 25 permits, and that's first come, first serve. Um, so typically in multifamilies, they do have their own off-street garages, which is why we limited the number um, that they are able to purchase. Uh, employee parking for uh, the Almeda corridor is we are not looking at identifying any streets for employee parking. Um, typically what the ordinance says, and this is what we've done in Museum Park, is we have some low demand streets where the employee parking is $25 per month. Um, but we are not identifying any employee parking within the residential streets in the Almeda corridor. Instead, we are trying to partner with the Greater Southeast Management District to make those lots available and safe and secure for the employees who will be parked there um, for, you know, six to eight hours, depending on how long their, their shift may be. Uh, the the uh, multifamily facilities that have more than 125 units are not eligible for community parking program uh, permits. I don't believe there are any facilities with this number of units within the Alameda corridor, but someone, you could please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So with the uh, community parking program, what we are recommending and what we'd like to move forward with is installing the signage that I showed to you previously. And let me, I'm going to bring that back up so that the residential streets that are not RPP are signed in this manner. So there'd be two hour parking from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. No pickup, uh, no parking on, on Tuesdays for trash day and then no parking after 8 p.m. Uh, Monday through Sunday. Residents on those streets would be able to get permits. Uh, we'd have to put multiple signs per street. Our expected timeline in order to put in all the signs, send out the notices, uh, and give residents time to purchase the permits. We're looking at early fall. So September of 2021 is when we can go live with um, having the signs and the permits out and actually enforcing this. So with that, I think I've provided all the information that I had to provide to you today. I know there's uh, there was a request for a crosswalk um, on Almeda, which Houston Public Works is looking at right now, and they're reviewing it, but they're not going to have any um, findings until uh, July of 2021 regarding that. And then um, Houston Public Works also informed me that they um, have installed some ad additional pedestrian signage at Almeda and Arbor. So you may have noticed that up there. And I'm just going to click over to my notes page real fast and just see if there's anything else that I needed to tell you that I am not or that I'm uh, forgetting. Uh, so the boundaries would be Southmore to Chenevert and Wentworth to uh, Southmore to uh, Wentworth, Chenevert to um, 288. Um, and with that, I am happy to now answer any questions that you may have or any comments you may have. I would ask that, um, let's see, I don't know if we were using the chat. You, if, happy to take any comments in the chat. I can read them out. Let's see. 
Melanie uh, has been manning the chats too. Okay, so Melanie, if there's any questions or comments, can you start um, pushing them out there so that we can? Because uh, I'm we not. We do have a we do have a hand raised. Um, okay. John and Paula Hutchinson. Yes, you are on mute. So if you could unmute, it, there you go. Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've got two questions. One is uh, in the verbal part of your presentation, you indicated that Rosedale would remain on the residential parking program and not convert to the CPP. Is that correct? That is correct. If it is okay. already designated as RPP, those streets have to opt in to CPP. So that is gonna be the choice of the residents. So you would do exactly what you did for the RPP, where you go and take a petition, and then bring the petition to us and, we, and then we'll start that process if you guys wanna move forward with CPP. But if it's RPP already, we're just going to leave that alone. And the second question is uh, the hours for the no parking uh, are the morning on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. uh, our recycling is almost never picked up yeah. in the morning. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know if it's gonna work. That, so that was one question I asked. I, I also live um, in in Houston, and I noticed that my recycling sometimes doesn't get picked up timely. And I I talked to Solid Waste Management, and they said they would make a you know because we have the signage up, it's a different situation now. Maybe in the areas when there's no signage, it's uh, they said that they would prioritize getting the trash picked up between seven to noon because now we have signage up, so it's a little different situation. So it's something that we'll just have to monitor and see how that works out. Um, but I do have, uh, you know, the the commitment from Solid Waste that yes, they 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 will do everything they can to get it done by noon, and they do agree with the residents that they do have challenges picking up the trash. So I don't know, yeah, you know, I can't guarantee you it's going to work, but it's something that I think we should try. And you know, we can always make tweaks and. Uh, changing times or adjusting schedules. It's something that we can work internally with the department. Thank you, Maria. Yes, thank you. Maria, we have William, if you would unmute. Hi, yes, I was just wondering, is there a map that shows uh, any streets that would not be included on this? I'm specifically asking about Southmore, the block of Southmore between Almeida and Chenever. That we have the map online, and um, I think it was in our last presentation. So maybe Melanie, can you post a link to the map in the chat? And Melanie's muted. We'll we'll post a link. Yes. Um, I think the question is about the resident only parking after 8 p.m. because South is very mixed. There are businesses, there are only two businesses on Southmore, and both of those businesses close before the restrictions would take place. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to contact one of the businesses who's actually on the call, Mitchell can chime in, but um, they're fully in favor of the restriction. Yeah, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. So uh, this is Mitchell Katine and John Netchman is on the call with us. Okay. And uh, we have we own the property at 1830 and 1834 Southmore, which is right next to the Walgreens on Alveda. And uh, we are in favor of the parking restrictions that are proposed okay. um, after a certain time in the late afternoon, evening. There's the, the street is just chock full. Sometimes they even park and block our driveways to get in and out of our building. So there is a parking problem here, and we would very much be in favor uh, as a business on Southmore to uh, make sure that these parking regulations come down our street. Okay, um, so for the resident parking only, that would go in front of residential properties. What it sounds like is this is commercial property, so let, that would just maybe be just a regular no parking sign. Um, but let me look at that specific block. You said 1830, 1834 Southmore, right? Right. And, you know, we would like to be able to have a permit. I, I actually park my car in front of our building all day long. So I would, uh, just like the residents as the owners, we'd like, you know, to have three permits, just like a, just like a home. Um, all right. Just to have a permits as the property owner and 
as you know, we have two businesses. We have a hair salon and we have a law firm. Okay. They're, they're separate addresses. They're separate um, appraisal district accounts. Okay. And and just to clarify, if I, I didn't realize if Mitchell and them on the salon, that is the second business. Oh, okay. And I was trying to contact the, the the person that runs the salon. So then both businesses that are on Southmore, that block of Southmore, are in favor of the restrictions. Yeah, we we own both businesses. Okay. Okay. I heard you. We'll look into that. Okay. All right. Do you have do you do you have, need my contact info in case you want to call me for any reason? Sure. Um, um, do, you, do you want to send it in the chat or you, I'm going to put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, that way you don't have to publicize your information. <laughs> I'll just, send it to you. I'll contact you. Thank you. I just put my email in the chat. It's maria.irshad at Houston TX. Did I type right? Dot gov. So uh, um, you can send me information after the meeting today. That'll be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there a hand raised? Um, okay. um, next Alley. is, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kelly's managing it. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, Kathy, go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you. And thank you for the meeting and opening it up to us. Um, I do have a couple of comments um, on that, on the trash, putting the signs out in front for no parking 7 a.m. to 12. We have some um, older residents on our street. Um, that don't work and don't have access to parking anywhere. Where do you suggest they park between seven and 12? And um, the other, my other concern with the trash is our heavy trash pickup is on Mondays and that's more of a problem to us than not picking up the trash cans that cars block the heavy trash and it sits there for weeks and sometimes months as I put in the public comments. Um, I have one other comment. Um, there is um, a business that puts cones out continually in front of their business. And it has, we discussed this two years ago. Um, we were told we couldn't use cones in front of our house. Why did the business get to do that? They put cones in, in front of their entire block and then up Rosedale and over across the street onto Arbor Street. Counted it, it probably takes up anywhere from 16 to 18 parking spaces. How is this fair and what's going to be done with it? It's been brought up a couple times already, and I don't understand why it continues. Um, we've had a new thing happen in the last couple of weeks that um, one of the business owns very large trucks. They are parking on Arbor Street. One of the trucks has a portable car wash and they take their cars out. They're washing their cars on the streets. I couldn't get by the other day because this truck was parked and the washing was on the other side. I mean, it just it just continues to grow. And um, my assumption is because their business, they're going to be allowed to continue to park there. And it's it's very upsetting. So those are my comments for right now. No, I saw I th you sent me the pictures of the truck. I think that, that email was from you. Maybe I got those pictures. Yeah, I, I sent the one with the motorcycles that okay continually blocked in my car and the accidents yeah so with the cones you know we are park houston all i can do and all you know my colleagues the team here at park houston is we enforce parking at the curb we we're not able to enforce um you know we write tickets to park to parked vehicles we need a plate on something in order to issue a citation so um, I know that continues to be a challenge in the area, and we do coordinate with the other departments to try and mitigate that. But I do recognize that we need to do, the city needs to be a little bit stronger on that. So we've heard you, and um, I think HPD also has, you know, challenge, because at the end of the day, if they're putting things in the right of way, it's HPD or inspectors um, that are supposed to be enforcing that. But there are higher priority items sometimes, most of the times, that you know win the day over the cones. But I do, I recognize what you're what you're saying, and I I will keep reminding the other departments about these issues out there. So uh, next we have Josh. If you would unmute, please. Uh, yes, hi. I I apologize if my voice is hard to hear. I'm having a throat issue today, uh, so I'll do my best. I'm not sure if this is the right venue to bring this question up, um, but I thought I'd ask it anyhow since we're talking about trash, which is not necessarily parking. 
Um, what about the nuisance behavior? So yeah. that that we're forced to deal with, it's it's a real problem. I got a two year old girl, and there are people blaring their stereos, revving their engines, cursing, simulating sex, urinating, throwing up, fighting. I mean, it's it's bad, and it happens all the time, all the time. Is, is there anything that can be done about that? Because we've talked to the businesses, and they seem to have no appetite to address this. Yeah, I think um, you know one thing is. Uh, Again, you know, I can, we can only enforce parking. So HPD, I know is out there every weekend and I know they, they are, are doing what they can, but nuisance behavior is something that, um, you know, we've worked in other areas that are very similar to what's going on here. We've been involved, you know, in the Washington corridor, in Midtown, in, um, in Montrose and sometimes, I mean, it's it's a tough nut to crack. I will I will I will say that, and I'm I can't tell you what the answer is to that, but I can tell you that you know if we can um, try and address some of the curb issues there, because HPD says they do spend some time uh, just trying to control traffic and whatnot, that it may free up HPD's time to deal with these other issues instead of having to figure out you know uh, the traffic. Uh, mitigation for the area. So um, I don't know if um, HPD, if Commander Johnson is on the phone, but we've had frequent conversations and um, I know they do get tied up and and they get pulled in a lot of different directions. So whatever we can do on the parking side to try and mitigate any involvement from HPD that frees up their time to manage these other issues. Um, And that's you know, what we've seen in other neighborhoods as well. Now, living, uh, you know, close to bars and whatnot and a nighttime economy, it's, it just, it does become a challenge for the residents. I, I myself live in the Washington corridor, so I'm familiar um, with these behaviors and uh, sometimes people are just going to do not so kind things when they're in different neighborhoods. And I hear you though. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I hope you're feeling better. And I'm sorry if I didn't give you the answer you were looking for. M- Melanie, can I speak to, I'm sorry, Maria, Mar- Maria, may I speak to uh, Mr. Francis's concern? Uh, I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sandy Stevens. I'm president of the Museum Park Neighborhood Association, which re- represents residents in Museum Park. And I would invite all of you, and I will put our um, uh, website address in the chat line, but I invite you to come to our meetings, which are held the first um, Wednesday of each month. Um, uh, Commander Johnson and members of her uh, team have uh, regularly attend our our meetings. And um, these are issues that our residents bring up. and um, she is uh, speaks to those issues quite directly. Um, she talks about her own uh, uh, difficulties in uh, in uh, addressing um, things like nuisance behaviors that we're talking about here. Um, they did have some extra funds earlier in the pandemic, and they were uh, able to be much more in uh, in pre- in the presence um, uh, circulating through the Alameda corridor to address them. Uh, however, that money went away. She is, she has also um, is in the process of um, requesting an additional officer, which she hopes will free up some, um, ad, you know, additional manpower to address those issues. And she is also working collaboratively with uh, the management district and um, setting up uh, collaborative meetings with the businesses, uh, basically to get them on on the same side we're on, which is to provide a good quality of life um, for the surrounding residents. Uh, she doesn't have easy answers. Maria can address the parking issues, of course, um, but some of the other issues that you're referring to are, are much more more naughty and much more difficult to address. But 
Uh, again, I invite you to come to our meetings um, on the first Wednesday of each month, although we are not meeting uh, in July, but uh, she is there regularly with her officers and you have an app opportunity to talk to someone who is um, who is addressing the kinds of questions that you're asking now. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sandy. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. Um, I know we've probably got some more questions, but I just saw a question in the chat about Wichita Street um, being a nightmare with traffic jams due to single lane flow with cars coming off the freeway going east. And I we did reach out to Public Works. This is something that I should have mentioned earlier, so I just want to bring you up to date on that. Uh, there was a request at the last meeting to close uh, Wichita from the 288 feeder to limit pass-through traffic. And we reached out to Pu Houston Public Works, and they said there's an existing neighborhood traffic management plan in queue uh, for speed bumps. Um, so, but there's no funding for the speed bumps. So uh, this can be uh, amended, and it needs um, funding from the council district or the residents in order to get speed bumps on there because there is no funding. The currently the program. Let me see what they. I'm going to read you exactly what they said. Currently, the program does not have funding in place, so there is no timeline to the completion of the applications. Uh, funding can accelerate the movement of the project, and they provided an email address. Um, so I'm going to put that email address in the chat. Um, so uh, if you were asking about Wichita, you can contact Public Works um, about that. Oh, what did I just put in the chat? That's not right. Okay. Okay, sorry. I I was scrolling through the chat. I wanted to get that before I I forgot. Kelly, can you go ahead and? Yes, we have four more hands raised. Uh, Lewis, if you would unmute, please. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So uh, I just wanted to uh, just only one question is uh, was the parking meters considered and and why they were not um, implemented. I uh, guess what the, the thought process was about parking meters. So parking meters is not off the table, but the time limits is the first step. And we want to, you know, when you go into a, a neighborhood that's kind of an urban area like this, we wanted to uh, not make the jump so quickly. We did the same thing with the Museum Area Municipal Association. Um, when we did community parking over there, uh, it was to try and uh, get the commuter parkers that were off the street and time limits has worked um, pretty effectively over there. In fact, Melanie, do you recall, we just we did a customer review um, and they were pretty much in support of the program that's been in place for a year over there. So, yeah. about, you know- It was about 60 to 70% support. Yeah, we're, we're supportive of the program. Um, so time limits is, is a good, first step um i'm we, we won't take meters off the table but to go from zero free a free for all and then to meters is a, kind of a long jump so we're trying to um do the least to make the most impact because meters are also one significant um meters also are a significant expenditure for the city as well yeah and, and there's a follow-up question so how, how often uh, do you plan on, on following up on or doing uh, what the next steps are to to check the effectiveness of this program and if in order to determine if meters is the next step to be implemented? So, yeah, no, it's a, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so just like when we implemented community parking in the Museum Area Municipal Association and Museum Park, we monitored it for a year. Of course, this was during COVID, so a, a lot of uh, six months of you know, there were six months of really nothing going on, uh, but we would we would do the same thing for uh, Alameda as monitor it for a year. And then we also come back and ask the residents um, the same kind of feedback that we did in May. We'd come back and ask you again. OK, it's been a year. What do you see? Have there been any changes? Um, and of course, you know, the Park Houston team is there every weekend. This is not the only location that we're at. So I know it would be great to have. Um, our team there, you know, all the time, but we do have quite a few areas that we have to kind of spread ourselves over. 
but we do make a concerted effort to be at Almeida um, when we know there are the peak problems are occurring and we are towing from there literally every weekend uh, from the RPP areas. And so our, you know, our the our frontline team that is out there reports back routinely. We're pretty we try to stay, you know, very much um, tied into what's going on in the Almeida corridor. So I would say a year, but um, you know, we always have the flexibility to, you know, tighten it up or lengthen it out if we need to, depending on how things are going. I think it's flexible that way, but definitely one year. Thank you. And one last question is being enforcement. I mean, I don't know if we did with this program. Uh, is there new enforcement personnel added into the payroll, things like that in order to enforce the two hours limit? I uh, know we will be using the existing resources that we have, so we are not hiring additional officers. Um, we already have patrols um, assigned to the museum park area. We use vehicles outfitted with license plate recognition to uh, monitor time limits. So it's a little bit more efficient. You know, I, I understand time limits. It seems like it's tough to enforce, but when we have the technology, we have the vehicles with the license plate recognition that drive down the street and they mark the plates. And then when our officer comes back in two hours or a little over two hours, if the car has not moved, our license plate recognition system beeps and says this vehicle has been over overstayed and is due a ticket. So um, the, the vehicles are already in the area. We'll have to up the number of patrols, especially in the beginning. You know, when we once we go live with the time limits, we will um, have a warning period for a little while and short period, maybe two weeks max. And then enforcement goes in and you got to do a little bit of extra enforcement in the beginning just to educate. Um, and then we'll probably go back to kind of a, a, a regular scale where we're certainly coming around frequently, but maybe not as frequently as we were in the beginning. So they get special attention in the beginning and we feel like we've made a difference, then we scale back. Um, because enforcement is a fine line. We, you know, you don't want to be the agency that is over enforcing and, you know, being told that you're hiding behind bushes and, and you definitely don't want to be the agency that is under enforcing because, you know, the, the parking is awry all the time. So finding that fine line is going to take some time and we'll just have to continue to monitor, you know, the number of citations, the number of cars that are parked there and uh, scale back or scale even larger. Maybe we need to have more vehicles out there, um, but that will be, you know, something that we look at on a, on a weekly basis moving forward once the signs are up. Okay. Um, now how do Maria, you this is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hello. I lift my hand. This is Nikki Knight. Hey. I can. I can wait. I can wait until the next comment goes. Okay. Okay. Then that would be Nadia. If you would unmute. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you guys for holding this meeting. Um, I I have a concern about the excessive signage that you guys are proposing for all the restrictions that we have um, on streets. And I wanted to know why um, it has not been considered resident only parking on certain streets, um, especially uh, off of Wichita Street where the mortuary is, that side of Wichita. Um, there's a commercial parking lot already on that street for people to park in. So in order to reduce the excessive signage and confusion, um, why couldn't we have resident only parking on the streets where there are commercial parking lots already set up? And why hasn't that been considered at all? Why do we have to share um, all the street parking when the commercial businesses have their own parking lots and also have free access to the Almeda street parking as well? So what other street besides Wichita would you want, would you say for resident only? Because there are some streets in the area that have businesses uh, that are operating. And are you suggesting that like, the patrons of those businesses would not be able to park on the streets? Yeah, because there's already parking lots on those streets. I'm so sorry, I'm not 
jumping out of turn, but I want to add to what she says. We see the same thing on Arbor Street. A few businesses that are here have ample parking for their patrons, and we continue to see lots of trucks and lots of congestion on the street. And again, you're punishing, almost punishing the residents to allow the businesses on Almeda to park in the residential areas. And again, I'm, I'm going to bring up because I saw in some of the comments that it's already it sounds like it's already been decided the Tuesday morning no parking at all. And I'm concerned about my neighbor across the street. She can't park far away and walk on Monday nights to get home. What is she supposed to do? No, I heard your comment about the residents. So that's something that I'm taking back to look at the signage to see what we can do and, and talk to solid waste about that. So that's one of my takeaways. Um, now, when we talk about restricting streets 24 seven, streets are uh, funded by general obligation bonds, which is funded by taxpayer revenue. So that's sales tax, property tax. The streets are owned by all the people in Houston, not just, I know it's my home and I want to be able to park in front of it, but in an urban an urban area that has mixed use where density is developing and increasing to take an asset and just minimize use of it is not in the best interest of of the of the city. I understand that we would like to see the parking only for for residents, but when you're talking about a mixed use environment, it's very difficult to put something like that in place. It just we need to figure out a way to share the streets, and that was our purpose, you know, to share it and bring some order to the chaos. And can I just ask, um, with the successive signage, um, do you think that there might be any problems arising from it? Because it does seem confusing. I mean, there are a lot of restrictions. And um, I mean, yeah. can we, no, I don't know. Can I agree with you. To me? Because I, I just feel like it's just going to be very confusing for everyone. Yeah, it is a lot of signage. That's what I said. It's downtown level signage. This is what we have on downtown streets. Um, we're trying to uh, respond to some of the the needs. I mean, it, it's going to be a challenge. It will definitely be something that we're going to learn from. I'm not saying that this is all going to make it perfect and that there is no solution that will make it perfect. There will still, even if you say nobody can park on the street, people will still be parking on the streets. Um, what we're trying to do is bring a little bit more order to the chaos and, you know, figure out how we share the streets because it is an urban environment. It's right next to downtown um, and the streets cannot be managed as a suburban environment. This is very much an urban environment. And that is, you know, the yes, the signage. That's why I wanted to show you all a picture of the signage, because I want to make sure that we, we all see that. There is going to be a lot of education that's going to be needed. This is why we'd like to issue warnings and make people aware, get the businesses to let their clients know, their patrons know this is what could happen. Um, but it will be, um, it, we'll, we'll definitely have to, you know, make tweaks. That's why we want to put the program in place and then come back to you guys after, you know, some time, get feedback from you, talk to the businesses, get feedback from them, and then make more tweaks. It's, you know, it's a living, it's a living thing. And while it's a curb space and it doesn't really have, it's not, um, you know, a living being, but it is something that we need to have flexibility on so that we can make those adjust adjustments and respond when we uh, have issues that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Okay. I think Nikki was going to go, had a response. Oh, yeah. No, I just wanted to comment and just to let everyone know, uh, my name is Nikki Knight and I'm with the Greater Southeast Management District. And uh, I don't know if all the residents know um, that we do work um, hand in hand with Park Houston, HPD, Harris County Precinct 1, um, and other agencies in the city to try to navigate these issues. And like Maria said before, it's really critical that we um, have to we that we work through this as a as a living uh, operation because things change day to day, 
Um, and, you know, it's one thing that's very unfortunate is that we can't control the behavior of individuals. And I, I probably echo this and say this in every meeting that, you know, our, our biggest concern and our issues are the, the intersection between preference, policy, proximity, and choice, right? People can choose how they come to these establishments. They also can choose how they behave once they, they get there and once they leave. And, you know, behavior is a relative aspect that we all have to deal with. So I think that in navigating this, we just have to continue to do the work, um, to, to ask the hard questions, to try some things that are unconventional, and see what works best. Um, there is no, no, you know, solution that's going to be utopian. But as we continue to do this work, I think that we are doing what's necessary to continue to have good results and to monitor and to manage. And when something doesn't work, we work quickly to to rectify it. There are lots that the Greater Southeast Management District, along with the TERS, has along Almeda and also on Wheeler. And we're working to um, identify some valet opportunities, um, some rideshare opportunities that will alleviate cars coming to the district so that people can safely enjoy uh, mm -hmm. establishments along the corridors. And I will say, um, and I don't know how much solace this brings to you all, that Almeda is not the only place experiencing this in our district. We have it uh, with Herman Park. We have it along Emancipation, Old Spanish Trail, Dixie Drive, Griggs Road because the nature of the district is changing. People are starting to uh, build up different um, day to night economies and it's, you know, it's new to us and it's coming pretty quick. So we're working to try to get ahead of it and also navigate what currently exists. So I appreciate forums like this where I can hear what you're saying, get with Maria, get with the team, our enhanced public safety team, as well as HPD and other agencies in the city to try to find a happy medium. I mean, everybody's not gonna be happy, but our goal is to make sure that it's safe and that it's accessible and that we can at least uh, continue the dialogue and, and figure out a way to make it work. Thank you, Nikki. Okay, Robert Wilson, if you would unmute. Well, yes, uh, thanks a lot. My name is Robert Wilson. I uh, want to, you know, first of all, thank you for coming up with at least uh, an enormous solution here and we could definitely uh, you know, try it out. Like you said, you know, I was going to ask you about the look back period. You mentioned a year, so that's good. So it's, we'll, we'll do a look back and then we can make some improvements as we go along. Um, my other question was specific to the restriction on Tuesdays. So I think there's a restriction in the morning. So let's say if we have guests and we give them uh, our permit so they can park here overnight, uh, certainly that becomes a challenge for us, especially if they do stay with us for a few days, then, you know, they have to be mindful about moving their vehicle somewhere else. So that, that, that I just wanted to point that out and maybe possibly if we could uh, maybe make an exception for folks with permits on that day. So uh, folks with permits, uh, they can certainly leave their cars there. And I'm sure there's plenty of space for these, uh, you know, for these uh, recycling uh, trucks, uh, the trash trucks to go around and pick up the, the, the trash. Yeah, I, that's one of my takeaways. I'm going to go back to the solid waste management department because originally they wanted the streets completely cleared. But if it's permits only, you know, it could, you know, there's still, it's not going to be as bumper to bumper as what it normally would be. So I'm going to take that back and let them know that there are concerns for folks who don't have parking, who live on those streets. Um, this is something that, you know, it just didn't, it didn't come up, it didn't come up when we were discussing with solid waste management. This is why these conversations are good, because I learned something and I could go back and and try and, and tweak the solution. So we'll definitely take that back. I'm not opposed to adding that to the signage if solid waste management thinks it makes sense. Um, I think the streets will be clear enough um, that they will be able to still collect the trash with just the residents on the street. So we'll definitely take that back. Great. That's all I had. I know I'm conscious of the time here. So thank you. Okay, yes, we're at 152. We have two more hands raised. Okay, who's next? Uh, Rahim, if you would unmute. Yeah, thank you for uh, everybody's effort and uh, participation and uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, solutions that are reasonable for everyone. Uh, one question that I have is related to the uh, enforcement uh, of uh, no parking. Uh, the citation part I get, I mean, you know, somebody get, puts a ticket on the uh, on the uh, front uh, windshield and uh, uh, 
somehow there's a mechanism uh, in place to uh, uh, to pay the fund and uh, whatnot. But as far as towing, uh, is that uh, is that is there a way to uh, or, or what is what is the standard approach that city has to uh, towing? Is it uh, contracted to uh, outside vendors that uh, are eager to uh, find a car that is parked in a uh, in a no parking zone and uh, pick it up as quickly as possible or uh, is it uh, how, how is it done? Sure. So state code current state code requires a peace officer to authorize a tow from the public right of way. So it has to be a constable, a sheriff, a police officer. The only exceptions to that is when a vehicle is parked in a tow away zone that is a residential permit parking zone or it's a booted vehicle. And then Park Houston, those are the civilian parking compliance officers that work with me. They are they are authorized to tow from those areas. Um, so you won't have tow contractors just driving around picking up cars. They a, a police officer has to authorize it. Um, that being said, after seven legislative sessions, we submitted we've been submitting a, a proposal to the legislature to authorize parking compliance officers to tow um, abandoned vehicles and no parking zones like we already do for RPP and booted vehicles. And on June 4th, I'm happy to report to all of you that Governor Abbott signed the proposal. So effective September of 21, Park Houston officers will have the authority to tow uh, from tow away zones and um, as, uh, as well as the RPP that we're already doing. Um, so you will not have tow vendors driving around just picking up cars. They will have to be authorized by a city official. So that's either a Park Houston officer or a HPD patrol or a sheriff. Any peace officer can authorize that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the uh, only follow up that I have is that uh, uh, what's the uh, what are the chances of uh, uh, having this uh, threat of the tow become reality uh, for folks that park there. I mean, I, I, I understand that uh, you discussed the fact that you're going to be uh, policing the uh, no parking and, uh, uh, you know, religiously in the beginning or semi-religiously, but uh, as a time, uh, is, is that the same thing? Is that the same concept, basically? Right. Um, so, you know, right now we've had issues, I will not lie to you, where we tow a vehicle from a residential permit parking area because a resident failed to hang up their hang tag and the vehicle gets towed. So it's very, you know, a permit program can be great, but we are human and, you know, people forget to hang up their placard or they, the placard is in a location that can't be seen by an officer. You know, human error will will happen and that's something that we'll have to be mindful of and residents you know when you have a permit you know, just be very careful with your permits that you display them uh give them to your friends when they come because they could get a citation or possibly a tow um you know it it, it does bring up those situations you're absolutely right you answered my question thank you thank you and i think we have one like kelly you said there's one more person and then i think we're approaching time. Oh, I think you're muted, Kelly. OK, there it is. <laughs> now we have three more minutes at two o'clock. Lastly, uh, William, if you want to mute, please. William, we can't hear you if you're if you're speaking to us. Yes. Oh, there. OK, now I can. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I just had a, a second question I didn't ask earlier. Um, so, how visible are the permits, and 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 does Park Houston want um, want the residents' help in identifying violations? Will it be like a number that we can call? Um, that's that's one. And then I would just like to kind of reiterate um, support for that notion that on Tuesday mornings um, it be resident only. I, I mean, the reality is, at least on my block, it's even if there's no one parked around the trash, it, it's not uncommon at all for the trash not to get picked up on trash day. I mean, that's 
fairly fairly common practice on on my block anyway. Um, and again, just to thank y'all, uh, I know that this some of this seems trivial, um, but you know, on any Friday or Saturday night, I can walk out in my patio and see at least three people urinating on my lawn, and it just after a while kind of gets old and and so we're hoping that this will help curtail some of that behavior yeah understood um okay so the permits are hang tags that you put on your on your uh rearview mirror we are also simultaneously working on another project um to use the license plates as the actual permit so that our lprs when they drive down the street they just see the plate and it's registered in our system as a permitted vehicle. So you don't have to hang that hang tag. We're not there with the with that. It's called a virtual permit. We're working on that. Uh, as soon as we are ready to go live with that, that's something that we would um, implement across all of our permit areas. So uh, initially we'll start off with hang tags with the intention of converting everyone over to virtual permits so that the plate becomes the tag. And that way we avoid those situations where I forgot to hang my tag or I put up the expired tag and my new tag was on my in the mail. I didn't you know, we'll, we could eliminate those issues. So that's that's the first thing. Um, the second is you were expressing support for the residents and I'm going to um, talk to Salt Waste about that because I, we are not opposed to having signage like that. Um, it makes sense. And we think trash can I think trash can still get picked up, but I'm not the trash pickup expert. So I'll have to talk to them and find out. And just real quick on a uh, follow up to what you were just saying, um, would I mean, part of the benefit of a hang tag is that when residents have guests, um, they be able to give guests those hang tags to use during their stay. And if you move that to a plate situation, then obviously that limits the how would that affect the ability to have guests um, be able to park? So we're looking at um, where there's, there's options here, right? So we can either keep a couple of guest hang tags and still use that. There's also technology where a plate can be entered into an app and that connects to our system. Um, and after 24 hours, it's gone. And that's your 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 guest permit. So we are working with our vendor to kind of work through the guest uh, parking challenges because it's easy to get a resident um, who's going to be there all the time, that virtual permit. It's the guest uh, parking that is is you know that we're working through with the technology on that so um we're not going to forget about that we we will have a solution for guests so that your guests can be able to come and you can still provide them some form of a permit whether it's a hang tag whether it's entering something into an account online uh something that's quick i don't want you to have to go through a lot of stuff because i know online is not can't you know not necessarily fun all the time too but we're working on it so understood Okay, Kelly, are we there? There are no more hands raised. Okay. Okay, I am going to go back in the chat. Um, I think I've been answering questions from the chat, but I we may have missed something. So we're going to go through the chat. We'll have an FAQ that we'll post online at our, on our webpage for Almeda. I've put my email within the chat. So if you have something that you wanted to mention that you didn't have the opportunity to, please send us an email. Um, and if you have questions, you know, we're happy to answer your questions. But like I said, we plan on uh, moving forward with getting signs ordered, installation, sending notices to the residents for the permits, and hopefully having a go live um, at the end of September in 2021 um, to try and mitigate some of these issues. But I do want to remind everyone it's not going to solve everything. It's just one step. Uh, you know, it's a it's a step towards progress. Um, with that, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for attending our parking meeting in the middle of the day. I'm sure you had better things to do, but we're happy to get such robust participation from this neighborhood. You're making the program better for us. We get new feedback, good feedback from you guys every time. So I really do appreciate that. And I hope you all have a great rest of your week and you try and stay cool. And I'm going to stop the recording now, right? Thank you, Maria. Thank you guys. Have a great one.